Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Wednesday morning here in the U.S. Afternoon where Lior is and evening where probably most of you are. Um, we're just so happy to have you here. Um, on my left um, is Leora. I don't know where she is on your screen, um, but she will be leading this conversation and I'll be here to assist and provide any sort of feedback and background um, on the pieces that we will be talking about. So Leora, Leora I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce Introduce yourself um, and tell us what the next hour is going to bring. Sure. Thank you so much uh, for having me, for feeling that this was a good idea to explore. And I'm very excited to be here today and to see some familiar names and faces. I hope that more will be joining us. And I realize that there may be people also watching this after the fact, um, uh, watching the recording online. And I'm, I'm so appreciative of the fact that um, this will be accessible for people. Um, I will try to offer some links and uh, to videos, photos, reading material, so that if you end up not being able to watch the digital season of Pacific Northwest Ballet and the up and the upcoming um, streaming of the latest performance, um, you will still have a chance of getting a feel for what the works were like um, on stage. Um, my name is Leora Amit. Um, in my current incarnation, um, I am in Toronto, Canada, and I work under an umbrella title of ballet. Let's talk about it. <laughs> and um, I have found that the talking about ballet, for those of us who are not uh, fortunate enough to partake in professional training institutions that also cover the history of ballet um, and dance and the context. So for those of us who don't have access to that, I feel that it's really a missing, a very important and missing component that I feel that I would love to share. Um, talking somehow seems to be a stronger suit of mine than the actual dancing part, but hey, it's okay. The, <laughs> the industry needs all of us. Um, so I'm here today to offer um, some little opportunities to um, maybe deepen uh, your understanding, appreciation, enjoyment of watching um, works as they are performed on stage. And more specifically, thanks to Cecilia um, following Pacific Northwest Ballet's repertoire for the coming season. Um, so repertoire, I know that we come from different countries and I'm also um, taking into account people who will be watching this recording from other countries altogether and we're not all, all native English speakers. So repertoire, repertory um, is the body of works that a company will be, is able to perform or has ever performed and this will apply to orchestras, to choirs, to dance companies. So in the case of Pacific Northwest Ballet, you can see on their website that they have a very illustrious list of works that they have performed over the years. And there's also this repertoire that they will be presenting to the public for this season. And the repertoire that they are presenting this season is varied. Some of the pro programs, the performances, contain several short works and they have given them particular titles such as the one that we're going to be talking about today which was given the title Beyond Ballet and it contains three works and the repertoire for the season also includes full length works so one ballet which is performed throughout the entire evening such as the Nutcracker Ballet or Romeo and Juliet and those two examples are of narrative works that tell a particular story but in ballet we also have works that are abstract and do not intend on relaying a particular plot or story but they may still have a feel a mood an intention etc um before we go into the actual works, I wanted to offer a few words about Pacific Northwest Ballet. Again, the context. Um, and I'll, try, I'll do some um, screen sharing at the moment and see if we can all see some um, photos and links that I've uh, put together for this purpose. So I'm just clicking here and clicking there. Oops. 
Um, and I'll take this time as Leora is setting up. Thank you. Also, um, I guess, introduce a different side of me. So many of you know me as a teacher, but actually my full-time job is a professional ballet dancer with the Pacific Northwest Ballet, which we know as PNB. Um, and I am a soloist dancer. So um, there are different ranks within the company. We can talk about all of that in another conversation because that could be literally a whole hour long talking about kind of the structure of a ballet company. Um, but I um, typically do more of the solo or principal roles. So like I may not be doing Juliet and Romeo and Juliet, but I may be her like best friend or something, you know, like kind of the supporting roles um, are typically what I specialize in. So um, you'll see and many of uh, what Leora is going to show you, kind of those more featured roles and works that we do. So um, not only am I a teacher, I'm also a dancer. So just wanted to point that out of just like, who's this random girl telling you about? It's like, well, this is actually my job. And I just was teaching a lot during COVID. And so now that's a little bit more on the back burner because dancing is a full-time job. It takes up a lot of my, my energy and time. So enough about me, Leora. Take it away. Thank you. We'll, oh, we'll get back to talking about you. <laughs> I promise. But for the moment, um, so in order to get some kind of an idea about Pacific Northwest Ballet and where it is situated, both geographically and kind of within the greater context of ballet companies in America and ballet companies around the world, um, I took the liberty of looking up some data information about ballet companies in America. And there's actually a website which is uh, called um, Dance Data Project. And you'll see on the left of the, um, of the image, a little screenshot from uh, according to certain parameters. Uh, per year. Um, there are other ways of ranking um, companies, like who is the oldest and has been in operation for the most time, for, um, and who has the most works by a particular choreographer, etc. So um, Pacific Northwest Ballet is definitely within the uh, 10 um, leading ballet companies in America. And I am not American. So for me, um, it is actually useful if I take the time and look at a map. Um, which is on the right side of your image, and you will see a map of the United States of America and the geographical locations of these companies. And you may think that I'm just, oh, this is, this is not important, this is not relevant. So I will claim that yes and no. It depends on your perspective and where you are um, at this point in your kind of development and, and um, where you are looking at things from, whether it's strictly the dancing, the training, the teaching, whether you come from a more administrative perspective, a production perspective, a more global perspective. So just like I happen to be a little bit familiar from my research and involvement with how things are in Nigeria. So for the Nigerian audience, I would say that it's a little bit like saying, well, we have Abuja, that's the capital, but we also have Lagos. But Lagos is not the capital. So why does Lagos have more of one thing and Abuja has less of the other? And if I'm trying to plan events or to see where would I sell more tickets or where would I have more of a following and an audience to receive a company or things along those lines, understanding these dynamics would be important. And I just saw recently on social media, um, somebody commenting about Port Harcourt. Why can't we be more like Lagos? So all of this will exist everywhere around the world. And I think within the internal conversation about ballet in America, it does help to see that ballet companies like New York City Ballet, American Ballet Theater, and Boston Ballet, they, they are on the East Coast of the United States, the one which is closest to Europe. And this has an impact on how a lot of things in the United States of America did develop and go further West. So Miami City Ballet is on the South, tip of the west of the east coast of the United States of America. And then you see a couple of companies within inland United States and then Pacific Northwest Ballet and San Francisco Ballet being on the west coast. That's just an introduction. For some of you, that will be more interesting for some less. 
I'll try to uh, move along and not get too hung up on one thing. <laughs> um, it will be impossible to say everything all at once in one sitting, although I'm really tempted to do so. So I hope that with the links that you will have access to, you'll be able to follow up on different things that are of greater interest to you. So within Pacific Northwest Valley, the, what is the scope, the scale, the size of this operation? So in terms of dancers, there are approximately 50 dancers um, with Cecilia being one of them. And this is kind of the official portrait of the company. And I believe Cecilia can be found sitting on the second from the left. No, Correct. I'm actually standing in the gray. Yeah. No way. Oh my goodness. This is so <laughs> misleading. Oh, wow. I'm very tall. Tell so me again. I'm on the end there. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> again, say this again. You are standing on the right side with a black tutu? Um, on no, the left side, at least on my screen. Left. The gray <laughs> lead part and black tutu. With your hair down? Um, yes. Okay, well, that's what got me. Okay, I was not expecting that. Okay, then. So Cecilia is there as well. And a ballet company, according to the tradition, so to speak, and this breaking away from tradition is something that we're going to come across throughout the talk today. But a ballet company like um, Cecilia mentioned already, will have a certain ranking system with corps de ballet being the, the largest and having most number of dancers, dancers, then soloist rank, some companies will have first soloist, second soloist, and then principals. And there are companies that will have even more intermediary ranks. And you go through the ranks as you grow as a person, as a dancer, you mature as an artist, etc. And you will be given different opportunities to perform according to your rank. And that's also going to come up um, when we, if we have a chance to talk a little bit about the casting for the ballets of this particular program. So Moving right along, uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet in the northwestern corner of the United States in the city of Seattle performs primarily at the McCaw Hall, unless they are touring uh, or invited to a festival, for example. And again, for the purpose of scale, McCaw Hall has a capacity of almost 4,000 seats. Um, this is a view from the stage. Um, and I go into this in order to impress upon you the scale of productions that a ballet company traditionally, again, that, that problematic word, traditionally is expected to present. So I think, um, I, think I've, I can move on. <laughs> now about the particular program that we're going to talk about a little bit in more um, detail today is one of several programs that the company will be presenting throughout the season and that too traditionally in North America and in Europe um, the season will go from the fall until the summer and it is my understanding that among other reasons before the invention of air conditioning it would not have been possible <laughs> to sit inside a closed auditorium with lights heating up the stage and the where the audience is sitting in the summer months. So that reflects that element, but there may be other uh, reasons why this is the case. So the repertory of this of, of the program we'll talking we're ta we'll be talking about today was named Beyond Ballet. Just take a sip of water, sorry. Um, and while she's doing that, I also just want to point out that this is our second perform or uh, repertory uh, production post um, the pandemic. So this is the second time that we've performed in front of a live audience since March 2020. So we're actually kind of new back on stage um, with this program. So I just wanted to point that out of like, we definitely were not performing during COVID. We've just now started re-entering the theater with precautions of um, va uh, vaccines and COVID testing to allow the actual performances to happen. So these are live performances in that beautiful theater that um, uh, Lior showed you the picture of, and this is not just an online offering. We, I will show you the online offering of a recording of a live performance, um, but these are live performances. So just wanted to jet that in there. Thank you. Um, that's another important point. 
um, in that throughout the pandemic, okay, for those who will be watching in the distant future, yes, the years 2020 and 2021 so far have been plagued by a coronavirus um, pandemic and has impacted um, lives and operations in many fields around the world, one of which was, of course, performing arts. And many dance companies and other um, artists within the performing arts um, had to kind of reckon with how do we continue um, keeping ourselves and our arts alive when we are unable to perform in front of audiences because this is so risky and dangerous health-wise. Um, and many companies did um, opt for digital offerings. So thank you, yes. Um, there have been live performances on stage, which unfortunately we can't attend. Even if we were like, I, I'm, I can just cross the border. I'm on the East Coast, you're on the West Coast, but even on the same continent, it's not that easy to just jump over to Seattle and watch a performance, even more so when you're living on another, in another country, another continent, et cetera. And we're very fortunate to have access to these works in this way. So back to Beyond Ballet. So artistic management, together with a lot of other advisors within the operations of a ballet company, will have to come to certain decisions of what will we present, what works, which, choreogra which choreographies, who, which dancers are going to dance and which works, how are we going to schedule them throughout the season, and what are we going to call them? Because we need to draw people in to buy tickets and to watch them and to, and to, arrive, and to raise curiosity within audiences because we, we need audiences. We're not, I mean, we as dancers, dancers enjoy themselves. It's not enough though, just to dance because a company has to survive, needs income from performances. And it, you know, you can't perform without an audience. It's part of the raison d'etre, the reason for being of being an artist in the performing arts. So Beyond Ballet is a title that was given to three works by three, on the one hand, very different choreographers, but on the other hand, with some common thread, at the very least in them all being American choreographers. And we, I hope that I'll have the chance to mention a few other ways in which there's a commonality. And now for the title, um, Beyond Ballet. A title assuming that there is something beyond ballet assumes that there is perhaps a place where ballet is ballet and anything, and what we're going to see somehow takes ballet beyond our expectations or beyond conventions and uh, standards. It may also relate to, so wait, so if there's a place that is considered ballet, at what point did that really start? If I see something which is earlier in history, will I say that, oh, well, that's not yet ballet. I can see a resemblance. Maybe it'll become ballet, but it doesn't look like it now. So that's a whole topic in and of itself in terms of the development, the history of ballet. But for this program, Beyond Ballet, and the image that was selected for a lot of the publicity for this program, was this. Ta -da. And if I, so this, this uh, is a form of communication. You're communicating with audiences. Some of them know ballet and some of them don't know ballet. So from the perspective of someone who knows ballet, huh, okay, I get it. I see what you're talking about. And the, and I'll, I put together an example. I, I'm very proud of myself, but you know, it has to stand the test of the audience. Um, I don't know how clever this is going to seem to the audience who will be watching this now or later. So I put together two, two photos of the same work. This is the um, second work of the three that are performed one after the other, um, ghost variations in two, similar yet very different poses. So on the right of my screen, I have a pose which I very clearly can identify as a ballet arabesque. Yes, absolutely. I can see the back leg pointed stretching to eternity. I can see the arms stretching forward. I can see the erect torso, the lowered shoulders and the head, exactly what I would expect from ballet. And yet they didn't choose that picture. They chose the other one. 
And the other one, huh, it's an arabesque, but from a purely ballet perspective, what's going on with that foot over there? It's flexed. Now I'm gonna say that they knew exactly what they're doing. Both the dancer was very intentional about that position and the marketing department was very intentional in their choice. So this is not a mistake. So maybe this already um, can be a hint towards what I can expect. There are going to be some things that I can identify as being very distinctly of the ballet family, but there's also going to be some things over there that are going to play around with it. So it's not strictly purely what I would expect in ballet. So that was just a thought. I love now, that, Leora. It's oh, really thank good. You. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have three works um, and whoops, so sorry. Um, and all the information, of course, is on the PNB, Pacific Northwest Ballet's website. And even in the titles, a little bit more, a little bit a little less, maybe I'm trying to impose, to force this idea of beyond ballet on everything. I'm going to try and bend things to match my theory, but let's see. So of the three works, the first is by an chore American choreographer named Ulysses Dove. Um, this particular work was choreographed on a different company in Sweden, the Royal Swedish Ballet in 1993. So we have here an example of a, a work which has been performed by others already. Moreover, it has also been performed in the past by Pacific Northwest Ballet. So again, in the greater scheme of things, there's, there's this element of um, this uh, verbal history of passing on from one generation to the next. So there may be dancers who did already perform this in the past and have some form of information and experience that they carry in their bodies and in their memories that they can pass on to the dancers. There will be somebody sent to stage the work. Of course, we're privileged to live in an age where we have recordings that we can use to learn from, to learn the ballets from, but it is always better to have somebody either who represents the choreographer or who has danced the work and also can relay all of this um, verbal tradition and help it um, cross from one generation to the next. The title of the work, and, I'll, and then I'll go into the, this particular work, is Dancing on the Front Porch of Heaven. Um, and it has a subtitle, another little title, Odes to Love and Loss. Now, this is very, very specific. It's not a general kind of um, title, spring, love in spring, loneliness of winter, that are kind of more concise on the one hand, but also leave you more room for interpretation. So I can take just from the title the idea that there's something very specific that the choreographer wanted to express, maybe was experiencing, and that is his expression of it. But on the same, but in the same breath, in the same sentence, I will also suggest that works, especially those that are not narrative, are not attempting to, to tell a particular story, do allow the audience to infuse, to bring into their own viewing, their interpretation. So there's always going to be what the choreographer intended. And there's also going to be what you as audiences with your experience, whether in dance or in life, bring into your experience of watching the work. So in order for you to get a little bit of viewing of ballet in this program, finally, at long last, um, I would like to start out with one little bit of the ballet, um, Dancing on the Front Porch of Heaven, Odes to Love and Loss. And, sorry. And before I do that, if you don't mind Cecilia helping me out once again with giving me a chance for a sip of water, um, would you be able to say a few words about the little excerpt, the small part of the ballet that um, you will be posting, breaking down the counts and how to do them and in order for people to actually experience on their own a little bit of dancing from the work. 
Could you say a word or two about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess just to start um, in, in correlation with this uh, video chat recording, if you're going to see it afterwards, um, I will be posting a video, probably around five minutes, teaching you the steps of this sex uh, section that you're going to see on video. Um, and then if you have bad service, we'll send you the video and you can watch it um, on your own time. Um, but it's a, a phrase where there are three women um, that come in the middle of actually a male duet. Um, and this male duet, you can see it in multiple ways. Some people see it as a um, as a gay relationship or as best friends or as a father son situation. It's like really almost how it's cast and how, where your mind is when you're seeing the work. So however you interpret the section, um, it's two men and then these three women come in in the middle. And one of the two men, um, has passed. And so this is a dance that is um, reflective of the two men um, and their relationship and then letting that spirit of the man who died go. And so the three women coming in are almost like the heavenly angels that are coming to take him away, take his memory away, take his body away, take his spirit away. So it's very very spiritual and emotional. You can see it as like, oh, you're just doing bores and you're going in a squat and that's it. But there's a lot more um, meaning and background behind it as well. Um, so yeah, so it's the men have just done a duet. The women come in from the back of the stage and bore on. And we're, we do all these like reaches up that you'll see. And that's to the heavens, to God, to whoever you think is up there. Um, no one, whatever. Um, and then you come down and then you do like this release of energy. So, um, I think Leora has the, the video to show you, but yes. just a little bit of background and I will, um, send, a five minute video um, teaching you the steps to this. Thank you. Um, I think it's, an, it's a wonderful initiative on your part to kind of uh, facilitate also experiencing a little bit of the work. Um, I think when I saw that part in particular, I felt that um, Nigerian ballet teachers and ballet students might relate to it in particular because I think aesthetically, there's a particular attraction to the grand, grand plié in second position that is very appealing. And I'm glad that there's an opportunity to see how could one develop that movement wise. However, the, the, the um, little um, segment that I would like to show you is in fact the male duet that Cecilia was just talking about. Um, I'll be um, screaming now for the sake of the Zoom, little pre-recorded segments. I hope the quality um, will not be an issue of uh, picture or sound. Um, either way, there will be links to wherever these have already been posted on social media and YouTube, et cetera, so that you can rewatch them from where they are uh, in the cloud originally. Um, and I'll start, um, all right, I will talk over it a little bit. I hope that will be okay. Um, um, there also is no, um, there's music, it's bells actually, so. Yeah, so the music, I hope it still makes sense, but you can also go back and watch it again. Um, the music is by a composer named Arvo Part from Estonia, and it was composed um, in the late 70s. It had nothing to do with the dance, and that was very, very short, so sorry. I'll, I will actually put it back because I think it's much nicer to watch them um, <sighs> than only to watch me. Um, the music itself is called, the musical work is called Cantus in Memory of Benjamin Britten. So, Arvo Part, the, comp the composer, wrote the musical work in memory of a composer who he admired. So both the dance has to do with longing and yearning and mourning of people who have passed, and also the music does. Um, that is not always the case by design or by circumstance, but that's another layer. And if my intention is to help um, benefit from from all of this um, 
sorry, from all of this, to my mind, beautiful layers of meaning to these dances, then that's another avenue. Last, before I move on, would be a male duet. What do you mean a male duet? In how would this relate to the concept of beyond ballet? So traditionally, if we take the place that is ballet, if I'm working with this title beyond ballet, then these would be 19, for the most part, works of the 19th century, most of them narrative. And most of them that if they had any two dancers dancing together in a way that um, expresses a relationship between the two, it would inevitably be a man and a woman. Definitely not two men dancing together. So that's one more way in which, again, am I forcing the dances onto the title or does the title really justify its, the, itself and the expectations of being beyond ballet? Another um, topic to consider before I move on to the next dance is the, the subject matter of death and dying and mourning and sadness. Oh my goodness. Are these subjects that are worthy of the ballet stage? And that too, we can find with works in ballet and definitely outside of ballet within the new um, genre of modern dance and expressionistic dance and postmodern dance, et cetera, et cetera. But even going back to invigorate ballet and to um, reinvent ballet and all those phenomena that are happening since the end of the 19th century, then absolutely, definitely, and yes, as subject matter, this is very appropriate. Whereas within that time frame of our expectations of ballet, what is and what isn't ballet, that would not have been considered uh, an appropriate subject to choreograph a ballet on. Okay, moving right along. And if and so, so yeah, at any point, if there's anything that you would like, <laughs> um, yeah. that you would like to mention, I think um, maybe just to close from Porch of Heaven, um, it's a very emotional piece if you know what it's about. Because I had a couple friends to come who came to see the piece, and they didn't read the program, they didn't know what it was about, and they didn't really understand what we were doing um, besides it being a lovely dance on stage. And I told them that it was about. Um, the choreographer's grieving process of those lives that he lost. And this was his way of letting go of their spirits and their, their memories. And so when you think about it's it's interesting, like what it's, so if you were to see a movie and you didn't know the trailer, you didn't know anything about it, you would just be surprised and you'd figure out the meaning as you go. But if you did a little bit of research beforehand, you view the piece differently. And so that's, what's interesting about this conversation is like now you have this background knowledge of it. So now you're gonna view the piece differently. So knowing as you watch the piece, it's about letting go of spirits. You'll now see a lot of the movements. We like have our hands at our hearts. Like that's to signify like your body and soul. And then there's a lot of like releasing of that. And so if you know the background of this is about death and dying, you figure you, you, you create meaning about what that step is or going up to heaven like that's letting releasing those souls up to the skies um so just it's interesting to to know watching it um but it's a beautiful piece i'll be in the recording that they will um be in there are six dancers three men and three women um so it's a very small cast which i think Leora will talk about um later in the other pieces but um yeah well, actually, no, no time like the present um, to bring up another way in which this program goes beyond ballet. So I mentioned that there are 50 dancers um, within the company of different ranks. And that sort of structure of a ballet company is based on the premise, on the supposition um, that we are going to have all of these dancers on stage at one point or another throughout the evening. Um, we don't have 50 dancers so that only 10 can perform for four performances and then another different 10 or the same 10. We have, number one, we have to provide uh, gratifying dancing experiences for all of them, but also 
if we're looking back at 19th century ballet, then the works themselves assumed this. So if it's going to be Nutcracker that we hope to, talk, to be talking about in the next talk or um, other ballets in the repertoire, Swan Lake, Don Quixote, um, Sleeping Beauty, et cetera, et cetera, you need those dozens and dozens of corps de ballet members being performing as a live uh, as live scenery on the stage and filling up the stage and and the choreographer would appreciate the opportunity to to choreograph structures and complex entrances and rows and circles and lines and exits and entrances and things like that and here we have an evening that has one work with six dancers, one work with eight dancers, and another work with eight dancers. And while it's true that it's not the same dancers in each and every piece, there are very few people on stage. That means that the weight of the performance is divided on fewer people. In terms of the, you know, the freedom to make mistakes, not an iota of it. It's not like being all the way the last swan in the court of ballet where maybe, maybe you can get away with something. I don't know, Cecilia, you can... but definitely if you have a smaller cast. So that's another way in which this program is beyond ballet in that choreographers would like to express things, not having to be restricted to using 50 dancers. And not only that, I suspect that they were, they were also given a certain freedom or artistic management took on this, the freedom of casting dancers in these very prominent roles who are not necessarily of the highest ranks. Because as I did go through the casts for the different performances and cross-referencing, okay, who appeared, who didn't, are they a principal, are they a soloist? Oh my goodness, there's a court of ballet member. So that's another way of breaking away a little bit from ballet tradition, where you have an opportunity to give dancers who are younger, both in age and in their career and experience, an opportunity to take on a role where you may not be able to do that in a ballet like Swan Lake with the same ease. But this is part of the dynamics of what might go on. So um, moving on to the second work. So, yes, two. The second work um, in the program is goes by the title of Ghost Variations. And I say this a little bit dramatically with some uh, ghosts. Oh, okay, fine, yeah, ghosts. Okay, let's see how you handle that one. There's, in terms of your expectations, what you might or might not see and how does the title relate to the dance in this particular instance the dance is choreographed um, by jessica lang um, with uh, there, there's credit for her partner in life husband and, and artistic uh, collaborator in that as well and was choreographed premiered world premiere of this work was for Pacific Northwest Ballet. So if we were talking about um, the first work having been performed by another company altogether, been choreographed on them, and also making the rounds of companies and now being in the repertoire of Pacific Northwest Ballet, we have a work which was choreographed specifically on them. Perhaps other companies will have the opportunity to dance the work in, in, in later years or even as we speak. And then, Somebody from the company perhaps will be sent to stage it for them. Their, a particular interesting circumstance was that this dance was first uh, presented as part of the digital season, the only season that PNB was able to offer its, its audiences during 2020, during the pandemic, um, and was choreographed under very strict um, COVID restrictions in working in the studio and rehearsing and performing, etc. And then the same work now has been adapted to being um, performed, not only for the camera, but on stage. Um, and you will see the digital performance of the live performance. Okay, that can be a bit confusing um, and complicated. Um, so the title Ghost Variations actually is taken from, taken from the name of one of the musical pieces that were cho chosen for the dance. So in this instance, so if Ulysses Dove 
used um, the music, musical work by Arva Parks, which is actually much shorter than the musical dance, than the, than the dance itself, and used the record, the, it, not the recording, it was performed live musically, but the music actually has to repeat several times in order to provide music for the entire dance, which is longer than the music. In this case, um, we have parts of musical works which have been strung together. Now, there is definitely a relationship between them. Unfortunately, I am not an expert in music. I wish I was, but it's a whole other world to go into. So the musical works were composed um, by a German composer named Robert Schumann in the middle of the 19th century. So in the 1850s, give or take. Um, and one of them was called Ghost Variations. Um, it was composed by Schumann at a point in life where he was experiencing the symptoms of mental illness. And the way he expressed what he was feeling um, as he was composing this music was that it was the spirits of dead composers who were communicating with him and giving him these melodies. Um, his wife, Clara Schumann, a concert pianist and a composer in her own right. Um, some of her works were also selected for the soundtrack of this music, uh, this dance work. Ooh, this is confusing. Okay, so there's a lot of Schumann. All the works were, the all <laughs> the works, the musical works are played on the piano. Most of them were composed for the piano, which brings us to another going beyond ballet element whereby a ballet company traditionally also has an orchestra of at least 80 members because how else would they play the Tchaikovsky score for the Sleeping Beauty, for example. It requires 80 um, musicians on different instruments. And here again, you have a situation whereby not only are not all the dancers employed for the dance, employed not in the, in the sense of working, they're still getting their salaries and they're rehearsing other stuff, but they're not used on stage. And similarly, the only musical accompaniment that you need for this work is one solo pianist. There are many other ways in which this will go beyond ballet, but I'll try to keep it short because we're running out of time and there's one more work to get through. Um, so a little snippet, a little excerpt from one of the promos that will give you a little bit of a hint as to the ghost element, if it is brought into the dance as well. And when I saw this, I, I, I was fascinated. So are they doing some new age kind of a thing with multimedia? Um, are they projecting this onto the backdrop? And I asked Cecilia to, if possible, when, they, when she had the opportunity to take some pictures of what's going on, because this actually might be a light and shadow play of dancers who are behind the backdrop. And I've already given away the secret. I don't know where that has to be a secret. Um, so I, I, I feel badly on the one hand, oh boy, but, you, but I'm taking all these surprise out of things. But on the other hand, you know, <laughs> we're trying to offer um, a, a, an opportunity for an informed viewing. And I, I really love a lot of the technical parts um, that go on and make things like this happen. So I will, I know that there was effort that went into taking these pictures. So I would love to share them. And Cecilia, if you have anything to share about what goes on behind. So the screen, what you're seeing, the white screen is the other side of what the audience is seeing. So the right-hand side of the picture is the backstage these dancers are not seen in the flesh by the audience. Because of the position of the projector, if they dance, their shadow will be cast 
onto the screen. And again, through the miracle of light and shadow and perhaps other things, the audience on the other side will be able to see only, only the shadows dancing on the screen. And like, this makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also want to point out that they spent almost as much time spacing um, where the dancers are on the stage in front of the scrim. So the, the flesh and body of the dancers that you see, same amount of time was spent with the shadows in the back. So that's how important the shadows are to the story and narrative of this piece. So as you can maybe tell or not tell from this, but there's that, that white um, um, light coming from the floor right there. Yeah, exactly where the, the icon is. So the closer you get to that light, the bigger your shadow is, the further away, the smaller your shadow. So you can see that they're pretty close to the scrim there, that big white um, kind of curtain that divides the stage that the audience sees and the stage that the backstage sees. Um, so the choreographer was very specific about like how big she wanted the person to be in relation to the dancers in front of the screen. So you'll see, um, we actually spent a lot of time, as I said, focusing on that. And you'll see that in the recording that um, I'll post tomorrow of this performance, um, how the size of the shadow changes and how that affects your emotion watching it. Because there's, I'm not, I'm not giving anything away because you're going to see it, but there's a point where the man is almost the size of the entire white curtain. How, how creepy is that to see a big giant dancing like that, as opposed to someone who's a little bit more life-size? So just Think about how that makes you feel when you watch it and know that all of those choices are 100% intentional, um, what the choreographer had um, in mind. Um, and she's she's extremely talented. Um, Jessica Lang worked with her husband um, on this whole process and they're an incredible team. So we were very lucky to have them here. Thank you. Um... I, I took a little glance at the clock and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so I won't go on and on and on and on like I can. <laughs> More interesting, less interesting, but I can. Um, and I'll, I'll transition over to the third work. Um, the third work in this program, Beyond Ballet, is by um, American choreographer Alonzo King with music by Jason Moran. And if I touch upon the, the title of the work, and the title of the work is The Personal Element. Um, if I touch once again on the idea of the relationship between the dance and the music, this is an example whereby the music was composed intentionally for this dance. So the music did not exist beforehand. It was not written beforehand, it was not performed by anybody else, it was non-existent. And through discussions and dialogue and appreciation of each other's work, artists can collaborate each in their own specific medium to create something that will complement each other, that will speak to the same ideas. Um, oh, and Cecilia is gone, but she'll be back. Um, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, that, 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 I, I missed a beat there, a heartbeat. Um, the segment that I would like you to see does finally have Cecilia dancing. And one thing impression that I got um, that was very striking when I watched the work was one more element in how this work goes beyond ballet. So again, if we limit ourselves to the concept of ballet as being those that we know that were choreographed in the 19th century, then we know that every work is repeatable. There's a set distinct choreography, it is taught, and only that choreography exactly with every little minute detail will be performed the next time and the next time and the next time. And the expectation is that each dancer will do it exactly the same. And the value in, in dancing these works is the ability to do it exactly the same. Whereas in the personal element, and this is where 
the name of the work can give you a clue as to what might be going on stage. My sense was that there were, uh, that there were elements within the dance that were somehow based on improvisation. Now, improvisation can have many different um, guidelines and rules within which to improvise. And Cecilia, again, maybe we'll be able, I, this is what we, we talked about, that she, <laughs> Cecilia will be able to uh, elaborate a little bit of that. But just to emphasize that within a work, there can be improvised elements. There can be works that can be completely improvised. So the ability to replicate them exactly for the next performance and the next performance and the next performance is, is not relevant. It's not a relevant expectation. And this is definitely a question of an entirely different philosophy and um, approach towards choreographing that was not present in the 19th century. And if I force the idea once again that I have to find this beyond ballet in every one of the works, then here we are again with one more way in which we can, we can see how um, this work is also going beyond ballet. So um, this is a duet danced by Cecilia and you will be able to identify your partner. And if possible, as we watch, would you be able to comment a little bit? Um, and we also talked about, about maybe demonstrating how, where, at what points was it your freedom to do something versus doing something that was prescribed to you by the choreographer. So. Yeah, um, maybe before we watch the video, um, I just wanted to point out that um, as we talked about and Leora presented that the first two pieces, so Front Porch to Heaven by Ulysses Dove was about the loss of souls and letting go of those memories and all of that. Like there's a storyline that was behind the creation of it. Then the second piece was the idea of the ghosts of a composer and the idea of the shadows representing that and the different dancers representing different parts of the personality of the composer. Maybe that's what you think, that's what I think about. Um, and then this piece, there is no story behind it. We weren't told, oh, this is a story about a couple and the this and the that and your friends with this person, your enemies. And like, there's none of that. It's literally, we asked, we're like, is there any intention behind this work? And he's like, no, this work is to showcase who you are as dancers and artists. And that can change every single show, every single rehearsal, because we're human. And that's what he wants to highlight in this piece. So you may come up with a story and I'd love to hear it. Um, but there is nothing besides the beauty of dance and the creation of artistry in this piece. So I just wanted to point that point that out beforehand. But yeah, my partner here in this piece will be Dylan Wald. Um, and this is a parada that we did together. Um, yeah, I may have you watch it first and then I'll talk afterwards. dancing that piece. <laughs> uh, so, we performed it last weekend and it feels like literally ages ago. So <laughs> thank you for bringing back, bring me back to that memory. Um, um, I'm yeah. sorry, would you be okay if I continue to run it in the background while yeah. you speak or is that? No, please that, do. Is that helpful? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so I'll lower the volume a little bit so that you can point out if you would like me to stop at any point that it's also possible. Yeah. So as yeah, you can you can play it, but as you're watching it, notice that there are a lot of ballet elements. So that was a fourth position, but a lot bigger. This is a tendu front, but it's in plie and bent over. This is just a little step. That's a fourth position. That's another fourth position, right? And then this is like a sixth position, first position, but with a lean. So this is what Lior is talking about, like the beyond ballet elements. Like it uses all of the ballet steps that you are all familiar with, um, but just pushes them beyond. So um, I guess I wanted to talk um, about what Leora had said about each so can be a little bit different based on the interpretation and what you're feeling. So, um, so it may look when you're watching it that everything is particularly chosen to happen on a, a beat in the music. So when there's a big boom, that's when you want to do the big jump. But that's that's a choice that I made, and I could make a different choice another show. So um, yeah, if we go back to the beginning, you can see that I've made choices on the timing of things. So everything is fairly even. Like this circle is kind of pretty even, and then this happens, and then I go to fourth position pretty quickly, and then that happens pretty fast. And so I'm going to show you. Um, in the flesh of like that whole sequence. So after I do the swivel around and the tondu and I do the jump, this could happen, the whole thing could happen really fast. Or as I did it in the video, it could be a little bit slower, a little bit more even. Um, so it's just those different choices that I made, those are all intentional choices to showcase something that I wanted that show. Um, but what happened that show was different the next show. Um, and so I'm in sync enough with my partner to know like what I need from him or what he needs from me to make the speed different or to emphasize something a little bit more. Um, and so that's, I love pieces like that because it, it allows you to explore a little bit more than a um, like a nutcracker variation or sleeping beauty variation that like everything needs to be on a particular count. But for this piece, we didn't learn it to music. We learned it without music. And then we rehearsed it, worked on it. And then they just put the music and then said dance with the music. And then obviously when that happens, I'm, I'm pretty musical. And so I try and catch like the big parts of the music and, um, accompany the movement to what the music is doing but I could intentionally make the choice if there's a big boom I slow something down and that's something that like oh wait I wanted something big to happen but you chose to do something smaller um so those are just like fun fun choices behind that movement so actually that video was from dress rehearsal and you're going to see the video from opening night and I did them differently. Um, you may not be able to see it maybe as, <laughs> as, as very different, but I had a very different intent when I did it. So this video that Lior showed is on YouTube, so you'll be able to watch it. So you could even watch, I'm gonna watch them side by side and see how I did them differently, whether I made different musical choices, whether I did something faster or slower. Um, so that is, that is part of the personal element, the title of the piece and like what the dancers bring their personal element. And those are the choices that they make um, in the pieces. But also another um, element of the beyond ballet theme that we're going with here, um, you can see from this image that Leora has on the screen, we're all wearing leotards, like kind of like shorts, like a little dress, like a white floppy shirt, like these aren't typical ballet costumes that you would imagine like tutus and tiaras and tights and pink shoes. Like our, all of our point shoes are dyed our flesh color. So that's an intentional choice of like wanting the line to be elongated. We're all in different costumes in a typical ballet piece. A group would all wear the same type of costume. We all are wearing different things. So that's showcasing individuality. Um, the personal, personal element, sorry for keeping, bringing the pun, but um, yeah, you can just see that it's very individual um, and that's not 
um, what a typical ballet would showcase. Um, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, do you have do you have anything? Oh no, else? no, 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 no! I'm so happy that <laughs> that we have the opportunity to hear from you about your experience because, um, as outsiders, you know, there's a there are a lot of things that we will would never hear about. Um, so it's a very, very unique opportunity, and I, I appreciate it personally, and I, I, I imagine yeah. that everybody who will be listening to this will also be appreciative of it. Yeah. Um, and if I were to try to um, to bridge over to the last little part um, before we say goodbye <laughs> to everyone, um, then I will mention that after a performance, again, traditionally, um, the way things work within the industry would be to anxiously wait for the newspapers for the, uh, that would be printed the next day and to see what did the dance critic say about our performance. So the, the reason this tied in for me was because I, as an audience member, might potential audience member, I might want to wait for opening night. Let's see what the critics say, and then I'll decide whether I go or which performance I'll go to because do I want to see this dancer or that dancer? Similarly, when I was researching to learn more about these dances, because I, I only had access to watching them, but watching them doesn't always give you the whole story. So one of the resources which were very valuable were um, reviews of critics that have already been published. So if a dance had been danced before, even on the other side of the ocean, I could read about that. If there was already the review of the run that Pacific Northwest Ballet just finished of these works, then I could read what the Seattle Times art critic said um, and learn from that. So some of the comments will be about a particular uh, dance, might be about a particular dancer and their performance. And some of them might be about the work or even about the choreographer. Oh yes, we can see uh, this uh, idea that this particular choreographer has been developing over several decades in many of his works. Wow, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know otherwise because I only get to see the one work. But now I know if I want to, to look at other works of the same choreographer and maybe I too will recognize a particular theme that he keeps on developing, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that will come from uh, publicity material and reviews and, uh, and marketing, etc., is when's the next performance? So again, if a ballet performance employing 50 dancers, 80 orchestra members, um, I think close to 100 administrative and other support staff, they're not going to be doing just the four performances of Beyond Ballet Rep number two. And there's a whole season to look forward to. So while those teams of dancers were rehearsing for this performance, I imagine there was other stuff going on in the background. And this is over to you both to tell us what to expect next and to say goodbye for me too. <laughs> Yeah, um, so quickly, uh, yeah, so we spent about three weeks putting uh, Beyond Ballet together. And so what three weeks means Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. rehearsals all day um, for this piece. And then we were also on the side working on a piece that we're doing in the springtime in April. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on. Um, and then more recently, we've started um, putting together the Nutcracker because that's what we're performing next week. So we actually performed this Beyond the Ballet um, two weekends ago. Um, so now we've been in Nutcracker, only Nutcracker rehearsals last week and this week, and then we're going to be on stage. So that's a pretty fast turnaround. That's two weeks to prepare Nutcracker, which is a huge, huge production. Um, and we'll get into that in our next video of like what that rehearsal process is like. And there are kids involved and the highest level of the school. And just there's there are a lot of different elements, but the company members typically have a week or two to just learn all of their parts. Um, and I know Lior is eager to know what parts am I doing? Um, <laughs> so I have a variety of different roles um, in act one. I am Clara's mom, who is the main young girl whose story we follow. So I'm her mom for the party scene, which is super fun. Um, and then in act two, I am lead Spanish. I am Arabian coffee. 
I am um, in the Waltz of the Flowers. I am a soloist flower, which is called Demi Flowers. Um, and then the principal flowers, which is called the Dew Drop, like the, the dew on the flowers. Um, and then I'm the Sugar Plum Fairy as well. So that is hmm, how many roles? Mom, Spanish, Arabian, Demi, uh, Dew Drop, and Sugar Plum. So that's six different roles that I have to have in my mind and be able to do at any time. Um, so fortunately, I've done this production for seven years. So I know the roles very well and I grew up with it. Um, when I was a young student, um, when I was eight years old, I was one of the soldiers and um, moved up in the different roles as a student. So I've been very familiar with this production, but um, yeah, so we open the day after Thanksgiving, um, which is a holiday that we celebrate here in the United States. I don't think anyone else does, but it's a lovely holiday where you eat a lot of food and you're with your family and friends. Anyway, we open the day after that, which I believe is the 27th of November, 26th of November. And we have, I believe, close to 40 shows of the Nutcracker. So that's two shows every day. Um, Bunch, bunch of things going on. So um, it's a really, really fun, big production. So as Leora said, this is one of our full length pieces. So this one had three smaller pieces. Nutcracker is just one full evening with one intermission in the middle for you to get snacks and go to the bathroom. Um, but it's it's a wonderful piece and we'll, we'll definitely do another one of these sessions about the Nutcracker and there are a bunch of different versions and this and that, but um, yeah, so I, I actually have to go scoot to rehearsal in class right now um, because we, we have a full day of six hours of rehearsals. So got to get all warmed up. But Lior, do you have anything um, else to, to close out? Um, no, I, I'd like to thank everybody who made the effort to come for the live. I know there, there can be many obstacles in the way. I'll thank in advance to anybody who tuned in to the recording at a later date. Um, and yeah, we do what we can, you know, so sharing the love is one of those things that we can do. So at the very least, let's share the love of ballet. No, absolutely. <laughs> and when the link is available to, available to me, I will send you all the link to watch the Beyond Ballet uh, recording of opening night. So um, opening night was the first performance that we did of this production. Um, so you'll be able to see all three pieces in their entirety, but do know that it's limited um, time availability for that. So all the links that um, Lior and I will share um, will be available for you however long you want. Um, but the recording of the performance will only be available for five days. So through Monday. So make sure if you're going to watch it, watch it during those five days um, and then it won't be available afterwards just because of regulations and rules and all of that. Um, so just wanted to point that out, but I will list all of that in an email and WhatsApp message to you all. Um, but thank you, as Leora said, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learned not only about this production, but ideas for you, for your school performances and different ideas and pieces that you wanna choreograph on your students and how you, it, you can be focused more on traditional ballet or there are ways to go beyond ballet and um, find new ways of expressing yourself while using the ballet vocabulary. Um, as always, feel free to message myself and I can pass any questions on to Leora if you have any on anything um, or information that you want that we didn't share. We are more than happy to do that in whatever fashion makes the most sense for you. But Leora, thank you so much for putting all of your hard work and putting this together. I know there's so much more information we wanted to share um, and we'll just keep, keep going with all of these. But um, thank you for your presentation and hard work and putting this all together. I really appreciate it. And um, I know everyone else does. So um, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your weeks um, and we'll be in touch soon. Leora, final words. Oh no, I'm speechless. <laughs> After all of that, nothing to say. <laughs> okay. Well, lovely having you all and we'll, we'll be in touch. Love you all. I love you too. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>